400 years after their deaths, Sir Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh are still two of Britain's great national heroes. They're remembered today as the loyal sea captains of Queen Elizabeth. Adventurers who set sail across the world in search of honor and wealth, plundering the Spanish main and discovering new worlds, laying the foundations of an empire. And at the time of the Spanish Armada, they came to England's rescue. But Drake and Raleigh's golden age of discovery and adventure, which we remember so fondly, was also a time of greed and ruthlessness, murder and treason. Today, they are heroes. Then, they were Elizabeth's pirates. Raleigh and Drake both came from Devon, the sons of poor gentry. They were part of a clan of seafaring families, which included the Hawkins, the Grenvilles, and the Gilberts. All from Devon and all related by birth or marriage. And it was this small group of adventurers that pushed the great Elizabethan expansion overseas. Giles Milton is an historian who's followed in their footsteps. Raleigh and Drake came from very similar backgrounds, but they were very, very different men. Drake was a great man of action. He was at his happiest when he was out on the high seas, on the poop of his ship, barking orders to his men. Raleigh was more of an intellectual. He, he was happiest in his ostentatious clothes, his flamboyant dress, his jewels. He enjoyed writing sonnets. The two men really couldn't have been more different. Drake was a generation older than Raleigh. Born on a farm in 1540, he grew up in Plymouth, where he learned his trade as a seafarer. In his twenties, Drake became an entrepreneur with an ambition to get rich and with few moral scruples. He set up business with his cousin, John Hawkins, transporting African slaves across the Atlantic in the hope of selling them to the Spanish colonies in the New World. But the Spanish Empire didn't welcome these British newcomers. In 1568, when they arrived with their cargo at San Juan de Ulua off the coast of Mexico, the Spanish opened fire. <laughs> It was Drake's first pitched battle. He fled in panic and abandoned his cousin Hawkins, who blamed him bitterly. The accusation of cowardice would fester for years to come, and the loss of both his reputation and his money left Drake with an abiding hatred of the Spanish. For Drake, the bloodshed at San Juan ended any pretense that there could be trade between England and Spain. From now on, Spain was his implacable foe, and he would devote the next few years to attacking and ransacking their treasure ships and bringing home their plundered gold. King Philip II of Spain was the most powerful man in the world. His Catholic empire stretched across both sides of the Atlantic and was sustained by the plundered gold and silver of the Aztec and Inca empires of the New World. Drake, in his efforts to steal this treasure from the Spanish, was acting as a freelance, but he also had the connivance of his queen. Elizabeth, who ruled over a relatively poor and insignificant country, coveted Philip's gold just as much as Drake did. So she gave him a license. He wasn't a pirate. He was a privateer. Piracy is a criminal act. Privateering is the same activity only with a license, with some kind of permission from a sovereign state. 
the Queen had given him a document that allowed him to go and attack enemy ships, to bring home the treasure of Spain. For him, he wasn't a pirate. He was doing... It was his patriotic duty what he was doing. He was attacking the enemy. Drake employed hit-and-run tactics across the West Indies. His fast, mobile ships were scarcely bigger than a double-decker bus and could be crewed by a dozen men. He'd learned his lesson at San Juan and avoided set-piece battles. This was a form of seaborne guerrilla warfare at which Drake excelled. It's not necessarily a very bloody business because most sailors aren't paid enough to die defending somebody else's property. You spot a comparatively small local ship. You chase it, you fire a shot across its bows, it surrenders, you take what you want off it, and you either took the ship and gave the crew a longboat, or you let them go, depending on which was the more profitable thing to do. He made numerous voyages to the Caribbean, ransacking the Spanish treasure ships. He even sent men on shore. He ransacked their caravans on land. And in common with all pirates, although of course he wouldn't be call himself a pirate, he buried his treasure on land and dug it up at a later date. Drake was earning a fearsome reputation throughout the Caribbean, and it was a notoriety he relished. In 1571, he left a calling card nailed to the mast of a plundered Spanish ship. Captain and others of this ship, we're surprised that you ran from us in that fashion. We only wish to speak with you. And since you will not come courteously to talk with us, you will find your frigate spoiled by your own fault, done by English, who are well disposed if there be no cause to the contrary. If there be cause, we will be devils rather than men. The legend of El Drac, the scourge of the Spanish main, was born. By now, even King Philip had heard of Francis Drake, and in 1577, his spies sent news that Drake had set sail once more in a fleet of five heavily armed ships. This was to be Drake's most daring voyage yet. This time, he didn't sail for the West Indies, where Philip was expecting him. He headed south. His plan was to cross the Atlantic and then pass through the Straits of Magellan at the southern tip of South America. This was the gateway to the Pacific and the heart of Philip's empire, the unprotected gold and silver mines of Peru. It was an astonishing piece of navigation, and it was to be the first time that a Briton had ever sailed around the world. As far as the English were concerned, Drake had now disappeared off the edge of the map. All Philip had to go on was rumour. The Spanish had captured John Butler, a privateer who had sailed with Drake on a previous voyage. Before he was hanged, he was interrogated by the Spanish Inquisition. Inquisition at Los Reyes, Peru. Examination of John Butler, pirate. Questioned whether he knew of men who had entered the Strait of Magellan, he answered there was no man in England who had passed the equinoctial line towards the south or who was planning to come. The witness thinks that if the Queen were to give a license to Captain Francisco Drake, he would certainly come and pass through the strait, because he is a very good mariner and pilot, and there is no better one than he in England who could accomplish this. It wasn't long before Philip discovered that Drake had indeed passed through the Straits of Magellan and was now heading straight for Peru, where Philip's officials began to panic. Their reports were sent back to Philip at the Escorial Palace in Spain. Philip was helpless and could only read of the events that were now taking place on the other side of the world. Don Francisco de Toledo, Viceroy of Peru. 
English pirates seized the vessel La Capitana and robbed from her a quantity of more than 14,000 pesos of gold and more than 1,700 jars of wine. Martin Enrique, Viceroy of New Spain. I cannot understand how the English pirates came into this South Sea. Now your majesty will see how important it is that we have security. Captain Juan Solano, Lieutenant Governor of Costa Rica. Captain Francisco has committed great robberies and carries as ballast three or four bound chests full of pieces of eight. Don Miguel de Arraso y Aguiar. It is terrifying. This voyage and the boldness of this low man, the son of vile parents. There is scarcely anything left for him to plunder since he has made such a good haul. By now, Drake had his eyes set on an even bigger prize. The Caca Fuego, a cargo ship, was sailing along the coast of Peru. It belonged to San Juan de Anton and was loaded to the gunnels with King Philip's treasure. San Juan de Anton was unaware that Drake was on his tail. On the first day of March, about midday, in the vicinity of Cape San Francisco, I, San Juan de Anton, saw a ship which was navigating on the same course. Towards evening, she came nearer. I saluted, but they replied, strike sail! And someone shouted, strike sail, Mr. Juan de Anton. If not, look out, for you'll be sent to the bottom. They seized 362,000 pesos in bars, reals, and gold. Francisco Drake embraced me, saying, have patience, for such is the usage of war. The might of King Philip was now being openly challenged by a farmer's son from Devon. Drake's circumnavigation of the world became one of the most celebrated feats in British maritime history. Fifty years after the event, an official account of the voyage was published, based on the account of Drake's personal chaplain, Francis Fletcher. The world encompassed. That valiant enterprise accompanied with happy success, which that right rare and thrice worthy Captain Francis Drake achieved, doth not only overmatch the ancient Argonauts, but also outreacheth that noble mariner Magellan, and by far surpasseth his crowned victory. A very different and less heroic account of the voyage was written by John Cook, one of the sailors. He suggests that Drake, who wasn't educated, felt threatened by the other gentlemen officers. One of them could speak in foreign languages. And when faced with bad weather, Drake accused him of conjuring. His paranoia led to an incident which Fletcher, in his official account, chose to gloss over. The story begins on one of the ships in Drake's fleet. The captain is Thomas Doughty, and he's serving with Drake's brother. Now, he accuses Drake's brother of filching some of the ship's stores. When news of this reaches Drake, Drake explodes. He is furious that one of his captains can accuse his brother of stealing stuff from the ship. The accusations festered in Drake's mind. And by the time they reached South America, he decided to do something about it. He wanted to put Doughty on trial for his life. Drake convened a trial and appointed a jury, hand-picked from his own crew. Thomas Doughty is a conjurer, a seditious fellow, and a very bad and lewd fellow. I cannot tell from whence he came, but from the devil, I think. 
After something of a charade of a trial, Thomas Doughty was found guilty. Hardly a surprise, really. There was Drake in the background pulling all the strings. He said to them that they had two choices. Either they sailed back to England with Doughty on board alive, or the other choice was to execute Doughty and continue on their voyage, which he promised them would bring them huge amounts of gold and would make them rich men. And now, my masters, Consider what a great voyage we are like to make. The like was never made out of England. For the worst in this fleet shall become a gentleman. And if this voyage go not forward, which I cannot see how possibly it should if this man live, what a reproach it will be. They that think this man worthy to die, let them with me hold up their hands. And they that think him not worthy to die, hold down their hands. And one by one, the men slowly put up their hands, not wishing to disobey Drake's will. Doughty took communion from Drake's chaplain, Francis Fletcher, and was beheaded. Why did Drake do this? It was an extraordinary thing to do. And the only plausible explanation is that it was a way of him showing his total authority over the men. From now on, it was Drake's expedition. No other commander, no other captain of the other vessels would get a look in. Drake was a ruthless master, and now he controlled the entire fleet. Cook's verdict was quite simple. Drake was a murderer. As Drake ransacked his way up the Pacific coastline, he realized that he couldn't go back the way he'd come because the Spanish would be waiting for him. So he chose a different route home, across the Pacific and around the world. It was a bold decision. For 68 days, Drake had no sight of land. Only the Portuguese navigator Ferdinand Magellan had tried this before, and he had died in the attempt. There was to be one more casualty of Drake's single-minded determination to succeed. On a deserted beach in the Spice Islands, Drake abandoned a black slave girl called Maria, who had been taken aboard his ship seven months earlier. She was now heavily pregnant. Whether by Drake or by his crew, it isn't known. Clearly, Drake did not want anything or anyone to spoil the triumph of his voyage. After three years, Drake returned to Plymouth. He had so much stolen Spanish booty that the Queen was able to pay off her entire national debt. Drake was allowed to keep £10,000 for himself, equivalent today to several million pounds. And he probably helped himself to a lot more. But he broke his promise to his crew and gave them nothing. He was hailed as a hero even though his attacks against Philip in the New World were a source of diplomatic embarrassment for his queen. What Elizabeth should have done was, of course, to cut off Drake's head, instead of which, as uh, one Spaniard uh, bitterly comments, the sword that should have cut his head off was instead used to knight him. The reason the circumnavigation doesn't lead to a war is because Philip II decides that this is not a good time to press it. But of course what that means is that Elizabeth thinks she's got away with it, Drake thinks he's got away with it, and it gives an enormous boost to other privateers and pirates to go out there and uh, try their fortune. One fortune hunter on the fringes of the court who'd seen and envied Drake's success was his younger cousin, Walter Raleigh, 
a man whose ambitions were even greater than Drake's. Both Drake and Raleigh wanted to be rich. Both coveted Spanish gold. Drake achieved this as a sea captain and a man of action. Raleigh as a courtier and a schemer. Like his distant cousin, Raleigh came from a family of West Country farmers. To his dying day, he was said to speak broad Devonshire. And no matter how high he climbed on the social ladder, he was always regarded by those who looked down on him as a man on the make. Later generations, typified by the Victorian painter Millet, would portray Raleigh's rags to riches tale as the romantic story of a young hero who followed his destiny lured by the sea. The myths and legends that still cling to his name were being told when Raleigh was still alive, because more than any other of the Elizabethan adventurers, Raleigh captured the imagination of his countrymen, both then and now. It says something about Sir Walter Raleigh that hundreds of years after his death, people are still telling the same stories, the myths, the legends about him. There's the famous one about him casting his cloak over a puddle so Queen Elizabeth didn't get her feet wet. No one knows if it's true or not, but somehow it symbolises the man, his flamboyance, his, his, his ostentatiousness. It's, it's, it's the sort of thing he should have done, even if he didn't. The, the other story, one of my favourites, is the story of him smoking his pipe and his manservant saw great swathes of smoke coming out of the back of his head and tipped a jug of beer over him thinking he was on fire, not realising that he was smoking tobacco, the tobacco that he'd brought back from the New World. It's for his colonies in the New World that Raleigh is best remembered. But it was in the religious wars of the Old World that the young Raleigh made his name and in England's first colony which wasn't in North America, but in Ireland. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth tried to make good the title she'd inherited from her father, Henry VIII, Queen of England and Ireland. In 1580, there was a Catholic rebellion against her rule. A group of Spanish and Italian mercenaries with the Pope's blessing, landed on the west coast of Ireland. The English army, which included young Captain Raleigh, marched west from Cork to confront them. Trapped at Dunanore, the fort of gold, the mercenaries surrendered. Raleigh was given orders to disarm the garrison and then massacre them. He followed his orders to the letter. It's a ruthless performance, but there is reason behind it. This was a very unstable and weak government, which was terrified that Spanish intervention would tip the balance and render the whole Kingdom of Ireland uncontrollable. They therefore meant to make an example of those who tried to intervene. The 600 victims butchered by Raleigh and his men included pregnant women. Their heads were cut off and buried in a field, which to this day is called the Field of Skulls. I see nothing at all to suggest that Raleigh scrupled over the shedding of a great deal of blood in this methodical, systematic slaughter of the garrison. I think he was a man of his times. Raleigh was to profit from the massacre. He went to London, claiming he'd found secret letters on the corpses of the butchered Spanish. No one knows what these letters contained, or if they even existed. If it was a ruse, it worked and Raleigh got access to the inner circle of Elizabeth's court.
When Riley walked into the court, these were the men he met. These were the men he aspired to be. There was Sir Philip Sidney, courtier, scholar, soldier, poet, and charmer. There was Sir Christopher Hatton. He entranced the Queen with his dancing. She fell in love with him. And there was Robert Dudley, her sweet Robin. He was the one that came closest to marrying the Queen. And these were the men who held real power, dressed in their customary black. There was Lord Burley, a great pragmatist, a man of high principle. When Drake returned from his circumnavigation and tried to bribe his way into the court, Burley, the only one of all the courtiers, said he wouldn't receive stolen gold. And there was Sir Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's principal spymaster. He was in charge of rooting out Catholic plots against the Queen's life. And here's Drake with his ruddy cheeks, just back from his circumnavigation of the globe. He looks a bit awkward in the stiff, silken costumes of the Elizabethan court. By the time Raleigh walked into the court, the statesmen had become elder statesmen. They were the older generation. Raleigh walks in, a young man in the most magnificent costume. He must have cut a flamboyant figure. He borrowed his fashions from the style of the French court. He wore satins and silks, velvets, his, his famous dentilated ruff that stretched out from his neck. He wore pearl and ruby drops. He had a bejeweled dagger by his side. His shoes cost a fortune. Riley cut a most impressive figure, not just because of his dress, but he was immensely tall. He was over six foot for Elizabethan standards. That was a giant. He, he must have really been an imposing character in the court. The Elizabethan court worked in a peculiar way. A sort of series of favours, the Queen favours. Everyone was fighting for the attention of the Queen, for the ear of the Queen. Raleigh wooed her, he charmed her, he flattered her, he wrote her verses. Here was a lady, she was in her 40s by this point. Raleigh was still a young man. You get the sense she, she couldn't believe she was being flattered by this young courtier. Raleigh, who was handsome, young and witty, achieved what Drake, the tongue-tied middle-aged sea captain, never could. Drake had to buy the favour of the Queen, but it was the Queen herself who showered young Walter with gifts. She gave him a monopoly over wine sales. He could charge every vintner in the country the right to sell wine. She gave him a monopoly over cloth. These were the foundations of Raleigh's vast fortune. He was totally dependent on the Queen for all of this. When he was 30, the Queen gave him a palace on the north bank of the Thames, downstream from Westminster. It had belonged to the Bishop of Durham, but Elizabeth took it from her bishop and gave it to her favourite instead. It was a draughty, mildewed sort of place, but Raleigh stripped it and brought in his own furniture and made it the most magnificent house in London. We have a description of his bedroom. His bed was covered in green velvets and lace and it was encased in plumes of white feathers. He had liveried servants wearing chains of gold. He ate off platters of silver. It was a splendid place to live. Young Walter Raleigh was now pocketing vast sums at the expense of wine drinkers and cloth merchants and was living it up in the biggest house in London. His ostentatious wealth and the Queen's favouritism created powerful enemies in the court. The newly knighted Sir Walter was soon being described as the best hated man in the world. Raleigh's ambitions knew no bounds. He wanted to cash in on the massive profits and honours to be made from privateering. He didn't set sail himself, but he did become a financial backer of privateering expeditions, taking a slice of the loot when the ships returned to port, loaded with Spanish booty. He came up with a scheme that changed the map of the known world. He decided to establish a foothold on the unexplored continent of North America. He thought it would be an ideal base for piracy and privateering.
he sent two of his ships on a reconnaissance. They scouted the coastline of North America and returned with two Native American chieftains, Juan Cheese and Mantio. Raleigh was always a brilliant publicist, and he realised that having two native chieftains wandering around the streets of London would be a great idea. I mean, imagine one of these. He, he instructed them to wear their feather headdresses, to show off their tattoos. He thought it'd be great for people to see them. It'd be great publicity for the colony. And that's exactly what he did. Manteo, looking like this, was wandering around the streets of London. In his efforts to drum up support for his plan, and to part potential investors from their money, Raleigh now developed a kind of imperial rhetoric, a patriotic and lofty justification for his business venture. The people of America cry out unto us, their next neighbours to come and help them, and to bring unto them the glad tidings of the gospel. And whensoever the Queen of England shall seat upon that form of America, and shall be reported throughout all that tract to use the natural people there with all humanity, courtesy and freedom, they will yield themselves to her government. The investors were largely from, from Raleigh's circle, his friends in the West Country, men like Sir Richard Grenville, and also members of the court as well. They poured money into it because they thought they were going to get spectacular returns. Raleigh didn't go to America himself, but in 1585 he sent 300 settlers across the Atlantic. After 10 weeks at sea, they landed at Roanoke. This has gone down in history as the first overseas British colony. But Raleigh's immediate concern wasn't to spread the benefits of civilization, but to attack the Spanish. If you touch Philip in the Caribbean, you touch the apple of his eye. For take away his treasure, which he hath almost entirely out of his West Indies, his whole bands of soldiers will soon be dismissed, his purpose defeated, his powers and strength diminished, his pride abated, and his tyranny utterly suppressed. The colonists were ferried to America by Sir Richard Grenville, a kinsman of Raleigh, a fearsome individual with an abiding hatred of Spain. On his return to England, he attacked one of the Spanish treasure ships he found en route and ransacked her. He brought her back to England and she had on board 120,000 ducats. It paid for the entire operation. It showed that actually Raleigh's colony would be a fantastic base for privateering and piracy. But the colonists that Grenville had left on the shores of America were already in trouble. On day one, their supplies were destroyed in a storm. They quarrelled with the Native Americans. Fighting broke out, and dozens were killed. Raleigh's grand plan degenerated into a brutal battle for survival. When new supplies arrived, Raleigh's colonists to a man chose to abandon North America and return home. The collapse of the colony was a disaster for Raleigh. Rather than lose face and his massive investment, he immediately began to make plans for a second colony and tried to persuade both himself and others of its certain success. An official report was produced, which presented America as a kind of Garden of Eden and a paradise. The watercolours, which had been painted on the first expedition, were now turned into a best-selling illustrated book, and a hundred new colonists were persuaded to set sail once more for the shores of America. The second colony was a very different enterprise from the first. The first had been a military operation. The second was much more a civilian operation. And Raleigh had a magic ingredient, 
women. For the first time, he decided to send women out. After all, it was women who did all the housework, who planted the crops, who did the cooking, who made the clothes. They were the ones, if anyone, would be able to keep this colony alive. Believing what they'd been told by Raleigh, these new settlers were convinced that they were sailing to a land of plenty. Wiping the slate clean, the colony was given a new name, the City of Raleigh, and a new governor, the watercolorist John White. White was a superb artist, but he was, in truth, a hopeless governor. There was a kind of mutiny. We're not quite sure what happened, but he was sent back to England. The colonists said, don't come back here unless you bring a lot of food with you. So White set sail to England. He was determined to return, but he was going to do so with food supplies. When White arrived in England, he discovered that war with Spain had broken out. England was threatened with invasion. White was trapped. And Raleigh's colonists were stranded on the other side of the Atlantic. When war broke out between Catholic Spain and Protestant England, it was due in no small part to Elizabeth's foreign policy. From where King Philip stood, that foreign policy seemed to consist of little more than piracy. I think England was considered a rogue state under Elizabeth. The way that she encourages and at times actively supports privateering and the way that she refuses to act against piracy is also a manifestation of her willingness to break the rules. The worst that she was getting as a result of this was occasional protests, sometimes very angry letters and representations from Philip II telling her to get her lads under control, basically. And Elizabeth, who was a wonderful actress, could play this one for all it was worth. Well, you know, I'm just a woman. I simply cannot control these military men, these sailors. I would love to help. I, I really want to establish law and order, but you know what it's like for a poor woman like me. After she had done this for a couple of decades, it's not perhaps surprising that she was a little bit cocky that she thought she could get away with just going, pushing him a little bit further. In 1587, Elizabeth chose her favorite privateer, Francis Drake, to lead a surprise attack against Philip's fleet, which was anchored in the port of Cadiz. Drake, the master of hit and run tactics, burned and looted everything in sight, making away with more than half a million stolen ducats. Unleashing her privateers in this way, not just against the New World, but against Spain itself, raised the stakes so high that Burley, Elizabeth's chief secretary of state, wrote a letter of apology to Philip, in which he said that Drake had disobeyed the Queen's orders and was now in disgrace. The Queen, meanwhile, was helping herself to a share of the loot. This time, Philip had been pushed too far. Drake's privateering had finally helped to precipitate war. Raleigh found himself sidelined. Real power lay with the inner circle of the Privy Council, from which Raleigh was excluded. He was a courtier, not a politician. He craved power, and the Queen wouldn't give him any. His flattery got him so far, but no further. She is not taken in by Raleigh. I mean, she's attracted by him. She recognises that he has great ability and a good mind, and she's a very clever woman. But she does not trust him. She thinks he's unstable, and she doesn't think his judgment is good. 
his political ambitions thwarted by Elizabeth, Raleigh may have begun to toy with the idea of betraying her. Raleigh's role in the great conflict with Spain is ambiguous. We don't quite know what was going on, what he was up to, but he got involved in a very murky episode involving a Spanish colonial governor. Raleigh had sent two of his privateering vessels into the Atlantic, and when they returned to England, they brought with them Sarmiento de Gamboa, one of Spain's colonial governors. Now, Raleigh took him hostage, kept him captive in his house, but he soon found that the two men had a lot in common. They got on rather well, and they used to discuss colonial projects with each other. What Raleigh then suggested is, frankly, bizarre. He suggested to Sarmiento that he wanted to enter the service of King Philip of Spain, that in effect, he wanted to become an agent, a spy, working against Queen Elizabeth. He also said that he wanted to sell a ship or two to King Philip's navy. From the Spanish ambassador to King Philip II of Spain, 8th of January, 1587. Sarmiento had several conversations with Walter Raleigh, the Queen's favourite, and signified to him how wise it would be to offer his services to your majesty, as the Queen's favour to him could not last long. Raleigh accepted the advice and asked Sarmiento to inform your majesty of his willingness, if your majesty would accept his services, to prevent the sailing of expeditions from England. He would, moreover, send a large ship of his own, heavily armed, to Spain and sell it to your majesty for the sum of 5,000 crowns. Philip could hardly believe his ears. He, he couldn't believe that Raleigh, one of the greatest men in England, was offering to sell ships to him, the King of Spain. It just didn't add up. He couldn't work out if Raleigh was being naive or incredibly clever. He certainly wasn't going to have anything to do with it. He turned down the offer. King Philip II's reply, 31st of March, 1587. It will be well to try to keep Raleigh and to encourage him to impede the English armaments. But as for him sending to Spain the two ships he says he wants to sell, that is out of the question. We must stop him sending these ships, in case it is a pretense or trick, which is far from being improbable. In all of these negotiations, these people are playing a double game. They, will all, they, they do keep their government uh, informed or the monarch informed, and they say that they are just doing it to string the other side along. And maybe they were, and maybe they were just testing the waters and seeing whether there wasn't a better deal there. Philip apparently didn't trust him any more than Elizabeth did. So Raleigh didn't switch sides, and the ship he'd promised to King Philip, he gave to Elizabeth instead. But she still didn't make him a privy councillor. A year later, Philip launched his great enterprise of England. On the 30th of July, 1588, the Spanish Armada was spotted off Plymouth Hoe. Raleigh was given a desk job. Drake was made Vice Admiral. Privateers had caused the war, and privateers were going to fight it. It's part of the legend that grew up around Drake's name after his death that as the Armada hove into view, he was playing bowls and that he insisted on finishing his game before setting sail to beat the Spanish. But Drake's loyalties as a naval commander were to prove just as ambiguous as Raleigh's loyalties as a politician, because for Drake, profit and patriotism were just two sides of the same coin. Drake had really never fought set-piece battles. What he was great at, what his strengths were, were attacking single ships, picking them off, plucking the Spanish booty. And that's the strategy he chose during the Armada. Drake was leading a squadron of English ships up the English Channel in pursuit of the Spanish. So he had a number of other captains under his command. His task, or his job, was to have a lantern at the rear of his ship to lead the other ships behind him. But when the action commenced, the lantern on Drake's ship mysteriously extinguished itself. He disappeared. His other captains couldn't find him. They couldn't follow him. They had no idea where he'd gone. 
And it was only later that they discovered that Drake had gone after one of the Spanish vessels on his own, the Rosario. Just coincidentally, she happened to be the Spanish pay ship. She was carrying 50,000 golden ducats on board. When they found out that he'd gone after the Spanish pay ship, they were furious. Sir Martin Frobisher, one of his captains, went so far as to say that he was a cowardly knave or a traitor. Now, those are pretty strong words for Elizabethan England. Drake was a man who would follow his own nose and his own interests over and above those of the Queen, or indeed, as in this case, the country. That's not to say that he wasn't a patriot, it's just to say he's an adventurer with very uh, clear idea of what his own best interests are, and he follows them. So I think it's entirely in character for a man who is very frequently on the wrong side of the law, you must remember. This is what he does, and what he does brilliantly. The Armada is essentially an escorted convoy. And the aim is to break through the very limited number of Spanish ships that ever meant to fire a cannon, which did all the fighting, if they could, to the targets inside that screen, which carried troops, guns, supplies, and money. And any of these would have represented a great loss to the prospective campaign if you could have destroyed them. So the man is doing his duty which would also have been very profitable. But then that's the best kind of duty. The Armada was eventually defeated by a combination of good luck and bad weather. There was an indecisive battle off the coast of France. English fire ships dispersed the Spanish fleet and a storm did the rest. Drake has ever since been fondly remembered as the man who was instrumental in defeating the Armada even though at the time he was given little or no credit. For Raleigh, the defeat of the Armada provided an opportunity to resume his business ventures and to pick up the thread of his colonial ambitions. By now, he expected that the men, women and children he'd sent to the shores of America would have established the city of Raleigh. In 1589, he dispatched Governor John White back to America with supplies. No ships had got through to Roanoke for the last three years, and now it was too late. All of Raleigh's colonists, including White's own daughter and granddaughter, had disappeared, and they were never seen again. But there's an interesting end to the story. A hundred years later, a surveyor sailed to the shores of North Carolina, and when he stepped ashore, he was met by an Indian tribe with fair hair and blue eyes. Anxious not to be linked with failure, Raleigh began to disassociate himself from the colonists he'd sent to their fate. Now he came up with an even more ambitious scheme, to find and conquer the mythical kingdom of El Dorado. After the defeat of the Spanish Armada, there was a boom in privateering. A hundred or more licenses were issued every year. The most notorious privateer of them all was still Sir Francis Drake, with a scar on his right cheek and a bullet wound in his leg to prove it. Now approaching 50 and middle-aged stoutness, he used the booty he'd stolen at sea to enhance his reputation on land. He hated being called a pirate. He, he craved respectability. And any Elizabethan gentleman wanting respectability bought one of these, a country pile. It's very fitting that Drake didn't choose just any country pile. He chose this, an old Catholic Cistercian abbey. The Spanish Catholics were his arch enemies. He ended up living in the nave of a Catholic church. He must have been lying there in his bed, 
thinking he'd done pretty well for himself. He became a member of parliament and Lord Mayor of Plymouth. But in London and at court, he was dogged by his humble origins. No matter what his pretensions, he was still the farmer's son who'd been born in a house with two rooms, one for the humans and the other for the animals. Drake tried so hard to be respectable. He dressed in the courtly costumes. He tried to get an entree into the court. He gave vast amounts of gold to the courtiers to try and buy their favours. They all took it, but they didn't really become his friends. He never really, he never really managed it like Raleigh did. In 1589, the Queen gave Drake orders to attack Lisbon. She wanted a repeat of his spectacular raid against Cadiz. It ended in disaster, and thousands of Englishmen were killed. He was hauled before the Privy Council to answer for his mistakes. Anxious to secure his place in history, he commissioned his chaplain to write an official biography. But permission to publish his memoirs was denied by the Queen, because now Drake was in disgrace. As he approached old age, only his recent failures were remembered. His early triumphs were forgotten. In 1595, he made one last privateering voyage to the Caribbean. He died from dysentery and was buried in a lead-lined coffin at sea. Sir Walter Raleigh was still riding his luck. He was the most brilliant Renaissance courtier, and there was no one better at flattering the Virgin Queen. Praised be Diana's fair and harmless light. Praised be the dews wherewith she moists the ground. Praised be her beams, the glory of the night. Praised be her power, by which all powers abound. Praise be her nymphs with whom she decks the woods. Praise be her knights in whom true honor lives. Praise be that force by which she moves the floods. Let that Diana shine, which all these gives. But by the 1590s, the Virgin Queen was no longer in the first flush of her youth and Raleigh now committed political suicide by starting a liaison with Bess Throckmorton, one of Elizabeth's maids of honor. A hundred years later, it was an episode that was still being told with relish by the 17th century gossip, John Aubrey. One time, getting one of the maids of honor up against a tree in a wood, who seemed at first boarding to be something fearful of her honor and modest, she cried, Sweet Sir Walter, what do you ask me? Will you undo me? Nay, sweet Sir Walter, sweet Sir Walter, Sir Walter! At last, as the danger and the pleasure at the same time grew higher, she cried in the ecstasy, Swisser Watter, Swisser Swatter! She proved with child. They marry in secret, the child is born, and then both of them do their utmost to carry on as though nothing had happened. And, of course, a secret like this can't be kept. It comes out. So the Queen gets to know of it. So what do they do? Well, instead of doing the sensible thing and falling prostrate at her feet and begging her forgiveness, they both try and brazen it out. And the Queen gives them both time. The Queen pays out the rope, if you like. But in the end, and they're still not showing any contrition whatsoever, she comes down hard on them. She puts them both in the tower. No courtier married without Elizabeth's permission, let alone seduce one of her maids of honour. But his stay in the tower was brief. One of Raleigh's privateering vessels had captured a huge amount of Spanish treasure. As soon as all the mariners realised that Raleigh was locked up in the tower, they just helped themselves to the treasure and took it back to their own homes. 
The Queen was furious and so were the court and uh, courtiers were sent down to try and recover all this gold, the jewels, everything on board. But the, the mariners wouldn't give it up. It took Raleigh. Raleigh was the only man who could get this treasure back. And so the Queen was forced to release Raleigh from the tower to recover all the booty that the mariners had run off with. Raleigh was free again, but in disgrace. And Elizabeth banished him to his country house in Dorset. But Raleigh was still desperately ambitious. And during these years of exile from the court, he began to plot his comeback. What he needed was a grand theatrical gesture, something that would capture the imagination of his queen, answer his critics at court, and pay him back handsomely. It was Sarmiento, Raleigh's one-time captive and friend, who first sowed the seed in Raleigh's mind of the kingdom of El Dorado. Every morning, the great lord or prince of El Dorado anoints himself with gold until his entire body is covered from the soles of his feet to his head. His looks are as resplendent as a gold object worked by the hands of a great artist. And he washes away at night what he puts on each morning so that it is discarded and lost. And he does this every day of the year. Raleigh convinced himself not only that El Dorado really did exist, but that he knew its precise location, and he was absolutely certain that he was the man to conquer it. Stranger things had been found in the interior of South America. Who was to say that some of these stories weren't in fact true, and that there were untapped riches in South America, just waiting to be exploited, if only someone would get in there and seize them? For the first time in his life, Raleigh crossed the Atlantic. Arriving off the coast of Guiana, he journeyed up the Orinoco in search of El Dorado. When Raleigh returned, he wrote a blow-by-blow -blow account of his adventures, and it became a 16th century bestseller. I wandered 400 miles into the set of country by land and river. The further we went on, our victual decreasing and the air breeding great faintness, we grew weaker and weaker when we had most need of strength and ability. Our companies began to despair, the weather being extreme hot, the river bordered with very high trees that kept away the air, and the current against us every day stronger than other. Raleigh had told his men that it was just two or three days' journey upriver. A month later, El Dorado was still nowhere to be seen. On the banks of the river, they met an Indian chieftain called Topiawari. He told them that he was 110 years old and that he knew of the Golden Man. I asked what nations those were which inhabited on the further side of the mountains. He answered with a great sigh that he remembered in his father's lifetime that there came down into the valley of Guiana a nation from so far off as the sun slept. They had slain and rooted out so many of the ancient people as there were leaves in the wood upon all the trees and had now made themselves lords of all.
I desired him to instruct me what he could of the passage into the golden parts of Guiana. He gave me an answer to this effect, that I was sure, with all my company, to be buried there. This was as far as Raleigh got. He went back to his ships with nothing more to show for his labors than a handful of fool's gold. On his return home, he was met with derision by members of the court. And the England he knew was about to change irrevocably. On the 24th of March, 1603, the Queen passed away in her sleep at the age of 69. She was a lady, said Raleigh, whom time had surprised. Others, less kindly, said she'd outlived her day. Raleigh owed everything he had to Elizabeth, and now he was left to face the new reality under the new king. James I of England and VI of Scotland. Raleigh's world really does end with the Queen's death because her successor is so radically different. The King quite likes handsome male favourites. He's bisexual. He's in quite good terms with his Danish Queen, but he prefers pretty boys. And Raleigh isn't that kind of handsome man. He's utterly heterosexual. Raleigh had really not much chance of winning over a mature Scottish king who has no complexes about Spain, who doesn't want to continue the war, and who is initially very suspicious of this late Elizabethan hawk. James had his heart set on peace. What did Raleigh do? He came hotfoot to James, and started advocating continuing the war with Spain, a new way of pursuing the war with Spain. It was a monumentally stupid thing to do, given the political circumstances of the time. The power behind the new throne was Robert Cecil. Raleigh, not for the first time in his life, found himself sidelined. And he chose to confide in a newfound friend, Lord Cobham. He denounced the king and his government. He discussed with Cobham the possibility of negotiating for a pension from Spain in return for intelligence. And he discussed possible landing places in England or Wales that, a, that an invading Spanish army might choose to, to land at. He was, in a way, giving giving voice to his um, imagination and he was giving vent to his irritation with the way things were going. When Cecil got to hear of their plots, he threw them both into the tower. Raleigh assumed he could talk his way out of it, but he couldn't, and he was charged with high treason. It's the classic illustration of the price R Raleigh paid for his ambiguity. I mean, all courtiers practice dissimulation, but with Raleigh, it goes very deep indeed. And he argued that he was trying to lead plotters on, whilst the evidence could be interpreted the other way to say he was part of the plot. Who knows? Raleigh was put on trial for his life. With a sense of the occasion, James decided that the trial should take place in Winchester Great Hall, under the medieval round table of King Arthur, the symbol of truth and honesty. When Raleigh walked into this hall, he was met by a terrifying sight. The place was packed. It was full of an angry, hostile crowd. There were people cheering and baying for his blood. This was the best hated man in the world. They'd come here to see him convicted 
for treason. Even worse than the jeering crowds was the prosecuting counsel. To a man, they were Raleigh's sworn enemies. They hated him, they wanted him destroyed. And at the centre of them all sat Sir Edward Coke, the Attorney General, who was determined to have Raleigh convicted, hanged, drawn and quartered. He had a team of the finest lawyers in England lined up in the hall to support him. But he was reduced to jeering, to bullying Raleigh. He didn't, he couldn't quite nail down Raleigh. He didn't know what to do. And Raleigh, don't forget, Raleigh was the most flamboyant, ostentatious individual. He used all his charm to save himself. He was fighting for his life. Sir Walter Raleigh, thou art the most vile traitor that ever lived. Mr. Attorney, you speak indiscreetly, barbarously, and uncivilly. Thou art an odious fellow. Thy name is hateful in all the realm of England for thy pride. Mr. Attorney, have you done? Yes, if you have no more to say. If you have done, then I have somewhat more to say. Nay, I will have the last word for the king. Nay, I will have the last word for my life. Raleigh gave an electrifying performance. It was a performance of pure genius. One Scottish friend of King James, a friend of the King's, said that before the trial started, he would have gone 100 miles to see Raleigh hanged, but by the end of it, he would have ridden 1,000 miles to save his life. You, gentlemen of the jury, mark this. I am no traitor. I was not so mad. I was never any plotter against my country. I was never false to the crown of England. Whether I live or die, I shall stand as true a subject as ever the king hath. My innocency is my defense. In the event, the jury took just 15 minutes to find Raleigh guilty. The much maligned jury, which considered for 15 minutes and then brought back the guilty verdict, actually returned a correct verdict in law. It was harsh, but it was just. The judgment of this court is that you shall be drawn upon a hurdle through the open streets to the place of execution, there to be hanged and cut down alive, and your body shall be opened your heart and bowels plucked out, and your privy members cut off and thrown into the fire before your eyes. Then your head to be stricken off from your body, and your body shall be divided into four quarters to be disposed of at the king's pleasure. And may God have mercy upon your soul. But James decided not to carry out the sentence straight away, and Raleigh was locked in the bloody tower to await his fate. Most people think he lived in some sort of dripping dungeon, but actually this place was quite comfortable. He even had his wife here. He conceived a son here, and he had friends regularly dropping in to talk about America and have a look over maps and plans. And you know, Raleigh was used to having a great army of servants to attend all his needs. Here, well, he had three to look after him. He didn't really like the lodgings here, so he decided to remodel them a bit. He put in a new ceiling, he changed the windows, he made it as comfortable as he could, and after the drafty Durham House and Sherbourne, this place perhaps was quite cosy. He used to pop outside and have a little walk on the ramparts, and it became something of a sight for the capital. Londoners used to gather beneath the walls and watch its majestic Elizabethan, a relic of the past, as he walked up and down. Perhaps Riley grew rather fond of this room. I mean, it's a sort of archetypal Elizabethan study. He used to write at the desk. He, he actually wrote his monumental history of the world here. He used to study here. And even more amazingly, he used to give lessons here to the Prince of Wales, Prince Henry, who was King James I's son. King James was the one that sent him here. Raleigh grew old in the tower. He passed his 60th birthday and he suffered two strokes. And yet, after 12 years' imprisonment, he persuaded James to give him one last throw of the dice. In 
In June 1617, the last of the Elizabethan adventurers set sail once more. Raleigh had cut a deal with the king. He persuaded James that on his previous voyage to El Dorado, he discovered a gold mine in Guiana. It was a lie, but James, who was nearly bankrupt, was willing to believe him. And Raleigh, hoping for the best, went back to South America. Had he come back with vast amounts of gold, James would have forgiven everything. He was given orders on pain of death not to attack the Spanish. But when he arrived at the mouth of the Orinoco, he found the Spanish were waiting for him. There was a pitched battle. Raleigh's son Watt was killed. It had been a lunatic scheme that had ended in failure and he blamed everyone but himself. El Dorado had only ever existed in Raleigh's fervid imagination. His dreams of wealth and honor and his hopes of final redemption were now dead. The age of Elizabeth's pirates was at an end. Four hundred years after their deaths, the legacy of both Raleigh and Drake is still controversial. You can't say that they were either thugs or heroes. They're both. That's what makes them interesting and remarkable men. If it wasn't for that risk-taking, that element of risk-taking that can be described as sheer lunacy at times, they wouldn't have done what they did. At the end of their lives, their reputations were in eclipse. Only later would they be remembered as heroes. Both Drake and Raleigh become major figures in maritime myths when the British want to reassure themselves they're the bulldog breed and that they're natural sailors. They appeal to the romantic sensibility and they are perhaps more important in their afterlife than they are during the lifetime. When Raleigh returned to England after the disaster of his second Guiana expedition, he was a ruined man. The death sentence of 1603 was still hanging over his head. But for more than a month, King James did nothing. It was as if he wanted Raleigh just to slip away. But Raleigh was determined to defend himself. He came up to London. He wanted to defend himself in front of the king. Well, the king remembered what had happened in Winchester. He certainly didn't want that to happen again. He convened a secret trial here in Westminster, and the men there condemned Raleigh to be executed. He was to be killed on the following morning. Raleigh had tried to secure a pardon from James, but once it became clear he would not get one, he turned the execution from a tragedy into a triumph. His life, after all, had become meaningless. And yet, on the execution scaffold, he found meaning in that he inflicts a total publicity defeat on the bandy-legged Scotsman who was killing him. King James had chosen the day of the Lord Mayor's parade for Raleigh's execution. He'd hoped the crowds would be drawn elsewhere. But a vast number of people turned up to witness this spectacle. You know, Drake had died 20 years previously. The reign of the Queen was a distant memory. They wanted to see the last of the great Elizabethans meet his death. And it's almost as if Raleigh had staged, managed his execution. He dressed in his finest costumes. He was wearing a magnificent ruff and he'd written a wonderful speech for his final exit. People set a lot of store by how you met your end. And it was entirely in, ca in character that he 
made an extremely dignified end. At times, a, a, a quite witty end. Yes, he spoke for the best part of three quarters of an hour. I thank God heartily that he hath brought me into the light to die and hath not suffered me to die in the dark prison of the tower. I have long been a seafaring man, a soldier and a courtier. And in the temptations of these there is enough to overthrow a good mind and a good man. But I hope to be saved and to have my sins washed away by the precious blood of our Saviour Christ. So I take my leave of you all, making my peace with God. I have a long journey to take. I must bid the company farewell. Strike, man! Strike! I perceive now that my death was determined from the very first day. <laughs> 